That's great. Okay, so so welcome to the third uh, TU community call where we are, we are discussing the TU um, Go library for for cross-platform uh, user interface, graphical user interfaces. And the format is uh, that we have about an hour of uh, discussion and presentations, um, where I will just start out with just the highlights from the last months, uh, new features, uh, ongoing work, and so on. And after that, we'll have a presentation by Anthony uh, with his Canvas work, to you Canvas work. And then after that, um, a presentation by Greg, I believe he's going to show you uh, some of his Android work, uh, some of his Android apps he's been doing with uh, with Geo. Right. So as far as the status, uh, uh, quite a lot of has happened in the last month or so. I think one of the most notable, at least the most, the work that went, that had the most effort put into it, is uh, Victor's Affine Transforms, where you can just let me just start presentation, because if you haven't seen that. Yes, you should be. I hope you can see my screen. If not, please speak up. So I find transformations is um, the ability for you to, to add not just the offsetting of, of, um, of uh, operations, but you can also scale them. You can share them. You can, um, you can rotate them. Anything that you would expect from from other user interface libraries um, is is now possible in in GU. So for about a year or so, I think since the release, there's been a small to do that said we only have offsets and we should also have all the other transformations. And Victor decided to do that work. So that was quite impressive, I, I would say, because he had to sort of change all the. Um, uh, all the assumptions around in the GPU package and so on, the assumptions that, that said that only offsets were possible. So in the kitchen example, you can press transform and it will show you rotations and, and uh, scaling. And it will also show you that you can still use the interface. So the transformations are available and applicable as, um, as you move the mouse around. So the graphics is transformed as you would expect, and the mouse co coordinates are um, transformed by the inverse transformations so that all the interactions still work. I won't say too much more about it because I hope to have Victor at, uh, at a later uh, GEO community call. So the next thing I think is interesting is also in the, in the Kitchen app, which is uh, two small features. One of the features is that you can now mask the editor, uh, editors. So you can have a very, very simple way of using um, the editor as a password entry uh, text field. Another feature is Gordon's uh, sliders, which is shown down here. Um, and then we have a few small features that has been requested for some time. Um, I don't think it, we have an example of them. So I'll just show you the app, uh, Godoc, and the two small features is the min size and the max size. So now you can, uh, instead of just having a size specification when you create a window, you can also specify the minimum and maximum size. And I believe that that works across all the platforms, or the desktop platforms at least. Um, and another great thing that has been asked at least for eight or nine months by Larry Clapp, which was finally implemented uh, this month, is that you can now have multiple windows like this, as you can see. They can all, um, they all control independently. You can have a Go routine for each window. You can have one Go routine managing several windows. And then someone actually implemented the closing, the programmatically uh, closing of windows that you don't have to rely on the user to close the windows. That's multi-windows. As far as uh, my, my, my own work, I have, um, there's a, if you haven't seen it already, there's a beta version of the Tailscale Android client. I'll link to it later, but you can just shortly see it running here in the, in the emulator, at least if it's still reacting, yes. And you can also see a small feature I did um, as a, as a result of a GitHub uh, request, is that I exposed 
or exported or converted the Roboto, the Google Roboto uh, font as um, true type, the, the, the true type data. I spitted that out in, into um, all the into Go packages as similar to, uh, to how you can use the Go font. So we have all these Roboto packages and you use it almost in the same way as you do with the Go font. You can you pass the true type data and then you can pass those fonts to your material and then all the app will use that font instead of the Go font. Right, I think that's about it for, um, for the status update. Let's just, let's move on to um, this licensing for the font packages. Okay, Daniel, that's a great question. I believe the Roboto fonts have the MIT license or something like that. Um, it's put in, I'll just find the page. So the licensing is very lenient. Yes, I took the license and put it here in my repository. So basically you can do almost everything you want with it, but it's not unlicensed. And that's also one of the reasons I put, um, I put all these uh, font packages in a separate uh, repository. So the Go funds themselves are put in, are in the are in, a, in a standard Go repository and they have their licensing over there and the Roboto funds are put in this um, Elias Now fund. The module name is eliasnow.com slash fund and the repository is here and you can see the license um, Oops, sorry. You can see the license files over there. So it's it's basically the same as the Go funds, but it's not quite as uh, lenient as uh, the the Geo repository itself. Right. Any other questions before we um, take on the first presentation? No. So Anthony, let's um, pass the attention to, to you. Hello, everybody. Hello. OK. <clears throat> you guys see my screen OK? Hello? Not yet. No okay. screen yet. Uh oh. For what it's worth, Anthony, we can't actually, um, you may intentionally have video turned off, but we can't see you either. I, I do have video off. OK, fine. OK, no screen yet? Oh, sorry. One second. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to hit the button to say OK. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Share. One second, here we go. Let's try this again. Is that now? Okay, how's that? That is working. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to try to go full screen here. How's that? Good? Perfect. Looks, looks great for me. OK, perfect. OK. So I'm delighted to talk to you guys about uh, the work on the Geo Canvas API. I remember uh, meeting Elias uh, probably about, what, a year ago, um, saying I'd love to do this work. And um, delighted to show you here it is. Um, so this is the placemat for it, which you've probably seen um, on my GitHub page. And we'll just walk through it real quickly. But first, I want to talk about the motivation for it. So I always wanted to have a high-level Go API for developers and designers to think in terms of the objects that they use on a visual display, things that you would think about in an illustration program like Illustrator or GIMP or something, text and images, lines and arcs, and so forth, and have the ability the API help you facilitate 
the arrangement of those things. And the use cases are you know, information displays, data visualization, which is something I'm very interested in, creative coding, and then even in presentations. And the link that you see below there is just my little specification for what that API should look like. One of the things that's, if you follow my work in DEC and other things, is this concept of a percent grid. Um, you'd like to be able to simplify how you think about the arrangements of objects. So you don't think in terms of, you know, a canvas per se that has a particular pixel density, but you think in terms of percentages. So you only have to think and remember numbers from zero to 100. And this is the coordinate system. It's the traditional one that you learned in school, X going increasing left to right, Y increasing um, bottom to top. Turns out this is actually uh, better when you're doing things like um, building um, graphs and that kind of thing. But it's a little different from how traditional um, graphics libraries work. And typically you just want to think about in terms of your high level objects and you just place them on the grid. So for example, you've got the line beginning at 1010, going from 3070, the circles there right there in the middle at 5050, and then the rectangle is at 9070. So when you think about it, so you the the geo canvas um, package starts with new canvas, which specifies the width and the height, and then um, the event system. Now this API may change a little bit, but the objects below probably won't. So you see things about that you would think about. You've got images both from a name and from an image dot image. Um, yeah, and your typical shapes, lines, circles, ellipses, squares, um, rectangles, curves, polygons, and then text, um, left aligned, centered, and end aligned. I was happy to see the, um, the additional um, thing for other fonts, and that will be, uh, I'll be adding those um, soon after. Elias talked about the work, Victor's work on transformations. They're now in the API, so you can rotate, scale, shear, and translate, as well as you've got um, convenience functions. Uh, map range is useful. For example, when you're mapping, you know, quote, world coordinates or world um, data to your canvas, um, the ability to show uh, the coordinates, if you saw the, um, the placemat, I'm using that. Setting the background color, showing a grid, and doing polar to Cartesian coordinates. This is the hello world for uh, GeoCanvas. Um, this is the whole program. But it illustrates uh, how you use it. Um, so within the frame event, as you'd expect, um, you begin your canvas. You start your background. In this case, you've got three, four objects. You've got the background, you've got a circle, you've got text, and you've got your image. And you're working in terms, there are actually two kinds of um, methods. I tend to use the ones that use percentage base, but there's also the absolute versions if you need to fall back to those as well. So um, here's the circle, it begins at 50, zero, which places the center here. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and then you've got um, text centered here, about 20% up, and it's white. And you've got an image that you're gonna place here, 50 at 70, using um, its width and height, and then you can also scale the image. So uh, I'm also interested in data visualization and charting. So there is a chart package in GeoCanvas. This is an example of showing composite charting, um, sine and cosine, and we'll, we'll go into how that's done. Here are the data structures for that. It, its basis is just some name value pairs. Um, and then around that, the chart box has metadata with titles and where you're gonna place it and so forth. It has its own methods on chart box, 
And these are the high level things. You've got a different kinds of bar charts, line, area, scatter, then the, your metadata, your titles, your frames, um, and your axes labels. The nice thing about that is you can decide which elements you want to put and you can compose them together. So that's very much the principle is making these composable charts. This is how you would read the data. Um, so chart read, take data read, I'm sorry, takes an IO reader, so we'll open it. Um, this is what the data looks like. It's simply tab separated um, pairs. Uh, we'll read them in and now once we've got our chart box, then we can start to manipulate them. Here's how you would combine, for example, the sine and the cosine. Um, we're going to specify that these are not zero based. Zero is the minimum because it will go below zero. So we set those as false. Um, typically, these are set to true. We're going to turn on a frame, which is a, a slight frame that you can see here. This is the uh, opacity. We're going to turn on our label. We only need to do that once because we're not going to do it um, for both charts. And we'll turn on our x-axis labels, which goes from minus 1 to 1 in steps of 1. So you change that. And you can also put the formatting in as well. And we'll change, we'll specify the colors, and then we'll just say we want scatter charts for both. Here's an example of, again, that composition where you're doing things side by side. Um, we specify the left and the right and the top and the bottom. We throw in our titles, and we'll, have, we'll turn on the frame as well, in this case, 10% um, opacity. And you, to make it side by side, we'll just make the offset, and we'll just change those numbers, and then we'll specify those as well. There is a command line version of this program called Gchart, um, where you can just specify your own data and you turn on the, the options that you want to build your charts. One of the things that I've been working on is a package called DEC with a scripting language called DEC Shell. Um, and this program called C19 Chart is what I use to um, to, to track COVID-19. Um, it just reads data from an open API and um, it generates DEC markup, but there is a program called GC DEC, which will read that markup and then show it. So for example, the, the program, the presentation you're looking at now is done in DEC markup. But you can see it's, it's well enough to actually render this one. There are other clients um, that you'll see here. So there you've seen the Hello World, um, a homage to Piet Mondrian, um, the tile one, just some throwing random stuff. So some of these were taken from the SVG work and it's very simple to actually make that translation because again, you think in terms of these high level objects that you place on a canvas. Um, here's an example of the, um, the transformation where you just take um, an, an ellipse and you rotate it around. Um, this is polar coordinates, testing the lines. Um, it's nice to be able to, to do tests, um, obviously, and these are your sort of graphical tests to make sure things are working. Here's the one for the lines, here's the ones for transformation, and here's ones for text wrap. This is how you go get it. So that's uh, Geo Canvas, um, sort of in a nutshell. Okay. So we'll, I'll just run them quickly, just so you can see how that looks. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. So one thing that I like about it, let me ex explore that out. I'm sorry, can you guys see my, my screen? No. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me. Let me. Um, one second.
for some reason it's not letting me show the whole screen. Ah, one second. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Sorry. Okay, let's start this over again. So here, those are all the clients. Um, I have a little script that just runs them all just for testing. Um, let me do that again just so you can see how quickly they come up. That was one of the things that impressed me is how fast they run. So here's a script that will just run through them all. Oh, they're all run. <clears throat> So there's the, um, let's move this one out of the way for a second. There's text wrap. Eclipse. There's the test for transformations. So one thing I just want to show you real quick is um, okay. So here's the code for the play program, which is which creates this placemat just so you can see how those elements um, are put together. So as you'd expect, there's the, the, the typical main. I'm using the flag um, package to be able to, uh, to control width and height. I set colors. I set the background color. Then I'm going to use this to create the an image that I get from an image.image. .image. Here I'm showing uh, this uh, as well as the text wrap. Then there's the lines. Call the line and then the coordinate method to actually show them. Circle, ellipse. Then we move over to the Bezier curves, polygons, then the rectangle square. Okay. Um, it has the ability to turn a grid on. In fact, let me just run that so you can see how that actually works. And I'll also make it uh, bigger. Well, there it is with the grid turned on and bigger. Okay. Any questions? I'll pause here. Any questions? Check the chat. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Da -da 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 how do animations work? Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Again, you can just, um, one of the things I haven't really done is to work with um, the, the frame API, I mean, the, the frame events. Animations will work by just um, simply moving your things. You can use the transformations, I guess. I haven't really tried that very much. Um, let's see. And, and one of the things I'd love to be able to do now that we've got things like sliders and things like that, to be able to zoom. Again, I, what I would do is just apply the transformations I would expect to be able to do that. Um, so yes, everything is quote laid out manually. I'm not using any of the layout widgets for that. Um, again, I'm, I'm just, 
again, the, it's kind of a philosophical question about instead of using automatic layout, you programmatically understand the relationships between them and then do it that way. Any other questions? I think Chris uh, was asking, the next question was, uh, do we have plans to, to add uh, pointer event handling? So there's, uh, I guess he's asking whether there will be some interactivity to the Yes, to the yes. And, and, yeah. yes, I definitely want to plan that next. So um, actually any help in doing that would be nice. Um, so, so again, these are just, if you look at the bottom, these are just, you know, normal geo things. So they should be able to, to work with with any of the other underlying things. And Daniel, he, he had a, um, a comment about uh, the present, the standard Go present tool. How, yes. does, uh, how does your DEC uh, presentation tool compare with that? <laughs> it's completely different philosophically. So, um, so DEC will, I, I mean, I can show you quickly. Um, but in, in fact, if now that you're at, I'll show you the the, the source code for the um, for the presentation that I just showed to give you a flavor. Okay. So present. I'm sorry, deck uses, again, a scripting language called DeckShell. And it's got a few keywords. Um, so it's got, you can, it's got variables, as you can see here. So you've got variables to control the position of things. You can specify colors. But the thing is, you've got, let me close, let me get this out of the way. OK. So the major thing is a slide. OK. So between slide and e-slide, you've got other things like this is a single slide that's got an image. Okay, this is a slide um, that's got some center text. It's got a text block and then more center text. And then what you do is you convert that if you run it. So if I So you run deck shell against it, and then you pipe that to, it creates deck markup, and then it creates, um, then other programs like PDF deck, for example, will generate PDF, or you can P generate an SVG, or you can generate um, um, a ping, a series of pings. You specify the size, you specify um, what fonts you want to use, and there you go. So it's different from present in that present, the deck, for example, doesn't have the ability to run code within it. Um, but it does have the ability to programmatically sort of lay out. Um, and again, you can see the same kinds of principles and that everything is present based. So in this case, um, I'm going to place a circle at 40, 45. Those are all percentages. All right. Any other questions? Perfect. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you. I'll stop presenting. Shall we yeah. move on to you, Greg? Hi. I think I've turned off mute. Um, I'm going to Present. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, go here. All right. Get my screen shared. Um, there we go. All right, my screen uh, showing up. 
see nodding. All right. So I'm going to talk about some of the uh, Android things. And let me know in the chat if you hear background noise, my air conditioner is here. Um, I'll turn that off. So uh, as far as Android programming is concerned, it's uh, the, one of the great things that attracted me to Geo in the first place is just how there's a single command that creates your APK. You don't need Android Studio. You don't need to do any of, you don't need Gradle or any of this, this stuff. Uh, it's very easy and fast to get apps up and running, but uh, there are limitations in that. Android is, does not have a native C API. Uh, it's Java-based, and there's a lot of things that you need to do little tricks to get, the, get to work and get integrated the right way. Uh, so I'm going to go through three kind of basic ideas about how to do that. And the first one is to use what little C interface Android does have, which is in the native development kit, uh, and that's limited access to certain Android APIs. Uh, and then we'll go into the Java native interface and uh, where we can call Java code. And uh, Geo gives you a good mechanism for getting uh, Java classes into your, into your APK file. And then Java fragments, uh, finally, will give you pretty much full access to things like permissions and life cycles. So obviously, lots to cover, so I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, there's links at the end if people want to see examples of how this works. Um, in the NDK, uh, a good use case for this is getting access to sensors. So here we have within your Android home directory, uh, there's this sysroot, and you, you've got your header files, uh, C header files for the NDK. And this is just an example of how, for example, you can get a, an instance of a sensor manager. And once you have that, you can start to do things with the sensor manager. And this all works quite well in C, and there's no Java required here. Um, I used a tool that I wrote originally for Objective-C that can create language bindings. It reads regular C just fine. So it's, uh, you'll see that I packaged the output of that into a package here uh, based on version 27 of the uh, Android SDK. Uh, and here, uh, it's converted all these C calls into Go. It wraps them for us and converts types and those things like that. So we can go here using our NDK package and get the default sensor for the accelerometer. Uh, and then we create a looper, which is basically a run loop. It's an event loop that runs within the thread. It's thread local, so we're going to lock the OS thread at the top. Uh, once we get the looper, we can, if we don't have one, we ask Android to prepare one. And all this you'll see in examples of how to use sensors. Uh, you can translate the C code directly into Go. You can use C and do a C Go call if you prefer. Um, but I find this to be easier. Uh, and once we've created our looper, we can prepare an event queue, enable our sensor, and set the sampling rate. And here I'm using 60 hertz um, to get a good smooth uh, view on that. Uh, when we go into our main loop, we're going to pull forever with an infinite timeout. Every time we get an event, we will check and make sure it's the looper we thought it was. And then we can pull out the event into a variable and some custom C code that gets the X, Y, and Z coordinates and puts them on a Go channel. So now we've got a little tight loop. Uh, this would be faster in C, uh, but it's fast enough, as, um, as I'll show later. Um, and then the rest of the event, uh, sorry, this is our main. Uh, in, in the Android-specific code, we have 86 lines of code. It's very concise. Uh, and then we go into our main file. Here, I'm going to draw a circle on the screen using the the you know, drawing primitives, make a rectangle and clip the corners off. Um, but we're also going to do a little bit of fun where if we hit the wall, we're going to bounce back. Um, and we have our X, Y, and Z position, uh, X, Y position and velocity. Uh, there's actually, I've updated this to scale to the display size um, using the, uh, the measure uh, variable within the event. Um, and now we're going to have our main uh, Geo code. Uh, we're going to wait for our 60 hertz ticker, and when we do that, we're going to check the velocity, uh, the acceleration vectors, and update our velocities, and then reposition our circle, the X and Y. And then separately, we're going to monitor the sensor channel and see if that tight loop in the NDK is getting a new acceleration value. If so, we'll put it in our variable here, and then, then we have our main layout where we draw the circle and uh, call frame. Every time we, the ticker goes, we're going to invalidate as well once you've updated. Now, the nice thing about this kind of select structure within uh, Geo is that I know that nothing is concurrent here. If I'm, if I'm up here in this case, then I can't also be updating the acceleration and I can't be, you know, drawing to the screen. So I know that 
when you look at this, you know, this is all sequential. There's no concurrency here and everything concurrent is going off in other Go routines. Uh, and then here, importantly, because the NDK changes from version to version, we're going to tell Go Geo that we're using version 27 of the NDK. And if you, um, you'll see when you read the header files, the NDK, there are annotations that say this is the minimum version of the, uh, of the SDK for that. So I'm going to see if I can get uh, a view on that on my device. Um, so here, here it is. There's the sensors. And unfortunately, you guys won't be able to see the performance of it because of the chat, uh, the meat. Um, but this is running quite smoothly at, at 60 hertz. This is a 90 hertz phone. I haven't tried to uh, improve and see how fast I can get it to run. Um, but we're getting our X, Y, and Z vectors in real time, and the ball is bouncing around the screen. Uh, this also runs, um, that's my main phone, but I have uh, this terrible one that I bought last year for as little money as I could possibly spend on an Android phone. It's about $20, and it runs just as smoothly here. Uh, so that's, that's kind of neat. Um, uh, let's see. Are you not? Let me check. So you're still seeing the presentation. All right, let me present something else. Let's see if I can stop and restart that. Uh, uh, my screen. This one. All right, thank you for letting me know. Uh, nope, that did not work. Uh, here. Is this working? All right. Yes. Ah, now you see it. Okay, so here you see these the balls are bouncing around on the two phones. But uh, I scaled the size of the ball, but not the uh, acceleration vectors. So the, the, this is a very low resolution screen, and this one's very high. But you see the, the geo scaling works correctly if you you apply it. Um, so that's that. I can. Um, where am I right now? Oh. All right. Did the presentation show up again, or are you still looking at the phones? Uh, That's the presentation again. Very good. OK. So um, uh, going on to the JNI, Java Native Interface, is basically two things that it does. It allows you to interact with Java virtual machines. And then once you have a virtual machine, you can ask it for an environment in which to manipulate Java objects. Um, so that. Um, you can use this to access a lot more of the Android API, the things that are not exposed in the NDK. Um, it's not 100% of Android, but it's a lot more than, than JNI is. So you first create a virtual machine, and then you ask it to give you an environment. And then the, the environment is actually a struct full of function pointers that so you can do things like call methods on objects and, and so on and so forth. So uh, in order to make this easier to use. I stole a bunch of code out of Pelscale uh, and packaged it separately um, so you can import this. And this gives you all of these JNI methods. They're C. Uh, again, you use this internally is using CGO uh, to call all of this stuff. And then, um, oops. All right. So some basics you can define here, a Java class. And then in your main code, you would import the JNI. I usually put a go generate statement at the top just to compile. And you, it's helpful to put this into the Java class hierarchy structure so that it's easy for the system to find it. And then um, we create a Java virtual machine. And then we ask it, the JNI do is going to run uh, code with access to the, the environment that that virtual machine gives us. So here we can call, find our class. We get a method uh, that is an uh, instantiator, so it's, um, and then call a new object on it, and so forth. And we can call all the methods on this class once it comes up. And then um, Gogio will find jar files. It'll look for, through every package that you import, and every package, you know, recursively. Uh, 
So if you import a library, that library has a jar file in its package directory, then Gogio will find it and put it in your uh, in your APK. So you don't have to kind of do anything manual to do that. Um, and the nice thing about that is if you import a library that tries that has capability to access Android things, it can come with its own Java code and you don't have to worry about trying to copy it anywhere. So, and you can see if you use APK tool, you create your APK and then open it and it will create these, um, it, you know, you'll, it'll extract all the Java code and you can see what's in there. Uh, it's helpful just to remind yourself where, where things are. Um, what Jay and I can't do directly is access um, uh, basically things that the Android activity does, and that's the main um, class in your app that, uh, that handles things like lifecycle and permissions. So you, uh, if you want to override the lifecycle events, so you want to know when the app is created or destroyed, or you want to get activity results, and this can be you're sending a, uh, an intent to another activity, you want to get the result back, uh, so you can communicate with other apps on the Android system, or you want to see the result of a permission request. You can't do that outside of an activity or a fragment. So we're going to see how we can use a fragment to do all those things. And this is just from the Android documentation. Uh, so what we've not done is kind of enhance the main EO activity to give you hooks into all these things. This allows you or a library developer to go and create this stuff on your own uh, without having to ask. Uh, EO to do anything. You can do all this stuff by yourself without having to, to modify the main system. So some basics here again, we're going to import the JNI uh, interface because we need to be able to talk to some Java classes. So we're going to take our previously we had done the, the do function on JNI with the with the virtual machine. Uh, we're going to wrap this inside another uh, function which comes from GEO from the app uh, package and the window uh, is going to give us back a pointer to the view and this is a, a Java object that lives within the activity and once we get the view we can uh, which we'll see below we can access the main activity and then we can add a fragment to it um, so first we're going to load our class this is our custom fragment class uh, and you'll see here it extends fragment and then we're going to create it, and then we're going to call this register method on it. Um, so once we go down to, to, to our fragment, this is the smallest fragment that I could make. It, uh, it gets the activity from the view by calling get context, and then it creates a fragment transaction and adds itself as a fragment and commit. And once it's added, Android will call this on attach method. So you're now a fragment. From here, you can do any other setup you need to do, or you can call back into Go to let the rest of your program know that the fragment's been attached successfully. And then, um, then I have a program or a, a library that accesses Bluetooth low energy, and it does that by installing a fragment. The fragment's just a connector to this library called Blessed, uh, which is here. Um, this one solves a lot of the quirks about how Android Bluetooth works and makes a cleaner interface. So I just access that library. And then in order to get access to Bluetooth, you need uh, one dangerous permission called access find location. And in Android now, if you want to access a dangerous permission, you need to ask permission at runtime in, in addition to having it in your manifest. So here we will have our fragment code, extends fragment. And then once we get on attached, we get called back because our fragment's been attached, we check our permissions and we press it if it's not, if we don't have it already. And then we can hear, we can see what happens when we get the permission results. All of this code you need to be a fragment in order to do. Uh, one thing, I'm not sure this is necessary, but I've had bugs before where my fragment gets reattached because the app is destroyed and recreated by the system. And then some of the uh, native methods are not available anymore. The C library looks like it doesn't always load in the same order. So I actually always ask the system to load the Geo library again. So that's going to look for the shared library where all the Geo, where all the Go code is compiled and they'll load it again. I don't know if this is necessary or if this is because of older versions of Android and they fixed it. I don't know. Um, so if anyone knows Android very well, let me know. I'm curious. Um, and then 
Uh, you also need to ask permissions in Android Manifest.xml. This is created by Gyo. In order to tell uh, Go Gyo that you want those permissions, you create this dummy package. Uh, you import it. It doesn't have any symbols, so you don't you import it anonymously. And then when you import this, it will put in your manifest these permissions for Bluetooth and find location, and also tell the system that you're using the Bluetooth features of the hardware. Um, so that's all automatic if you import this package. And there's other permission packages as well for different types of things. Um, and now our main file here, there's no platform-specific code at all. There's nothing to do with Android or any other platform. You, we import this Bluetooth low energy library. Uh, this works on Mac OS and Android uh, transparently to the user. And all we need to do is call enable with our window. And that allows uh, it to register the fragment as we saw before. And then we have our big select statement where on one branch, we're going to look at all the Bluetooth events that come down and handle them. And then another branch, we draw, we handle window events and draw to the screen. So, um, and then the API from the BLE library, just simple enable, connect, discover services and so forth. It looks a lot like uh, for Bluetooth, because that's what the original version of this was. And then a few, um, you see the phones again? Is that popping up? I see nodding. And you can see um, heart rate monitor Bluetooth is off. So we can turn it on. It gets an update state. Start scanning, finds a heart rate monitor. And then my heart rate is elevated because I'm hoping it works. Uh, so we'll see. I guess it's not connecting. Let's try that again. So anyway, it's doing some scanning. It does work. It might take a while. There it is. And here we have a, <laughs> that's my presentation resting heart rate. Um, and then, uh, so that's it. That's the end of what I had to present. There's links here at the back. Um, if people want to see where these libraries are. And um, I also have a password manager that I wrote that Again, Mac OS and Android, and it calls the Android uh, open keychain to get your cryptographic keys, and it can decrypt encrypted passwords on your device and put them in the clipboard. Um, so, any questions? So, you mentioned that you had a problem about. Um regarding initializing the GU library when, you, right. uh, when you're when you using fragments, right? That's right. So mm -hmm. again, I, it's hard to track because you need to wait um, for the activity to be destroyed in a certain way. And it's not, it didn't happen with the screen rotation trick that you had suggested I try, um, but it would happen after 24 hours. So it's tough to debug something that <laughs> breaks once every 24 hours. Uh, so uh, I couldn't figure out another way to force it. Uh, this is one of the things that I tried to fix it. And I haven't seen this in uh, six or eight months in any of my apps. So I think this is probably the fix. Uh, I've also updated Android in the meantime. And probably there may be different behavior in the current versions. And maybe this isn't needed anymore. But it's, it's difficult. I don't know enough about the order in which things are done because um, it's possible that the fragment is attached before, well, the main activity for Geo would be attached and then the fragment's attached. That might happen before the fragment for Geo gets its on attach callback. So that might be what happened. It might be that you haven't loaded the library because you didn't know you were installed yet. But it's hard to, I don't know why the on attach methods would be called in a different order, but it's possible, I guess. So it doesn't have anything anything to do to the uh, to the fragment being destroyed and recreated. Uh, well, it definitely requires that to happen. Um, yeah, because I, because uh, if, yeah. I know there's a call you can do on a fragment that says this is the persistent fragment. Right, so but then it has stays to, in, has it stays to, resident, and yeah. I don't know. You know, that's not good behavior, I guess, if it's not necessary. Okay. Um, 
depends on your use case. If you want something that yeah. survives across uh, activity retrace, rotations and recreations, then you would use the persistent fragments. But right. otherwise, yes. But it's it, actually probably better to let it be destroyed and just save your state. I think it's the recommended yeah. Yeah. Um, approach anyway. So Chris, I think it's highly uh, discouraged. Um, so Chris, you had a, a question about fragments? Yeah. I I can't recall all the details. I tried to Google for it real quick, but I couldn't process it very quickly. Um, I know that something about fragments was deprecated. The whole thing is deprecated, yeah. Okay. Fragments are deprecated. There's, a, so. there's the support library where you import the support classes, and that recreates the fragment interface. What it means is you need to package 10,000 Java classes from the support library into your app and call it that way instead of this way. So um, I feel like until they actually remove it, then this is much easier and cleaner to use. Uh, but yeah, there's now fragments been replaced by a version of fragment from the support classes. Aren't the support libraries themselves deprecated? They are. I don't they know. Are. <laughs> I, I think so, what happens, we're, we're using them, um, in, in this case, in Greg's case, and, and, and in my case for TailScale, we're using fragments uh, more or less non-visually to track the life cycles of the activity. And the intention of fragments, uh, back when they were added to the Android SDK, was to have fragments, visible UI fragments, that have their own life cycles that you can add to a main activity, not a main activity, just any activity. So the idea is that you could you could you could slice up your user interface into fragments that were small activities in themselves. And I think um, and and in the old days you had an activity for each window or, or each kind of task that you could do in an inside an app. And Google has moved more and more into um, that there is the case into the style where you have one activity that implements the entire app, and then you use, um, I don't even recall what they're using today, but they use something to, to switch to transition between all the different states and, and screens of your application. And I think they did that because activities were a neat idea, but it was very difficult to do, um, to, to, to easily transition Particularly if you had, say, some, some overview window and you pressed something and you had to zoom into that and another activity had to start and show you the details of that thing you clicked on. If you had this effect where you wanted the, the, the item to zoom up and become part of the next, next activity, mm -hmm. um, you thought, uh, so, so, you know, a visible transition, then that was very difficult to do with uh, separate activities. And I think all those kinds of problems made them sort of abandon the idea of having many activities and many fragments and so on. So that deprecated for their original purpose, I would say, but in, for our purposes, I think they're perfectly adequate, as Greg said. Yeah, I just wonder, I don't know what the timeline on them disappearing entirely is. I don't think they'll ever uh, disappear. I, oh. um, I haven't seen APIs re removed from the Android SDK. As, um, as far as I know, they don't remove okay. um, APIs. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't been doing Android long enough to know that. That's actually I I, I checked it out with, uh, again with um, while working with Tailscale. There's a new lifecycle tracking callbacks uh, SDK they have in their support libraries, but it turns out to be at least for my case much more complicated to use than just doing as uh, Greg has has shown you using a fragment attaches to uh, to the activity and then you get the callbacks whenever it's attached and created and destroyed and so on. All right, well, thank you. Oh, and, and, and perhaps we should mention that the reason it's, it's we actually have to do this is that on Android, whenever you do something that changes the configuration of your application, for example, rotate your screen, the default behavior is to destroy your entire activity and recreate it in the new conf configuration which is very nice for not having bugs um, where your program assumes a, a certain orientation or a, a display um, density, pixel density and so on. But it's very, very difficult to survive, some, to have some state to survive between these recreations. So, well, 
And that's why we need yeah. fragments to attach to the activity and tell you whenever something, uh, the activity is destroyed and, and recreated, or you ask for a permission and then you can get a, the, the result back some other time whenever the user uh, clicks yes or no and so on. So there's a lot of asynchronous, asynchronous um, let's say just request to the operating systems that is that are, that is difficult to manage without um, life cycle tracking. Yeah, and as far as that screen rotation example, it's funny because here we can check orientation every frame and that would be perfectly normal. Every single redraw, you say what orientation mm -hmm. is it? And that's not the way most people program is, uh, UIs. But it's much easier in, in Geo to do that, and you just know every single exactly when you're drawing what's the orientation, what's your screen with tonight. Yeah. 